<laughs> it's, great to, it's great to, it's great to, it's a little early. It was fun actually chatting over here when we, people were coming and saying, this is a big crowd. And I said, it's, you know, it's, it's as big as Pearl Jam. People were camped out here on the sidewalk <laughs> all night long. Um, as I've talked to a lot of you on the phone, as I've answered your emails, there's an enthusiasm <laughs> that I think we share on this. It is really exciting. My wife is sick of me right now because I get home and go, guess what else? Guess what else? Guess what else? It's very, very exciting and I'm glad to see that you're equally excited because frankly it's five o'clock on a Wednesday and to have you here is telling a lot. There it is. What do you think? Look good? I was so excited when I finally got that picture because it changed it for me to see that um, to know what it's going to be like. Of course, that's the artist rendition for those who don't know what stage it's at. It doesn't quite look like that yet. <laughs> it's actually, I can tell, and I was just saying to some others, I can see these parts when I go out to it. It's pretty exciting. Um, if you haven't driven by, feel free to because it is very exciting to get to see that progress there on schedule. Um, the construction crew there, and I'm going off of someone who actually knows how to measure this. Uh, they're fabulous and um, we're excited about the opening this, this upcoming August. We will be having school starting there in the 2013-2014 school year. Now you've had a long day. You're here um, hoping to get some information and I'm sorry but I'm going to put you to work just a little bit here. You've got a couple things that I want you to be watching for. I threw out sticky note pads and it was before it filled up so much so it might not be where you want it to be. Those are for you to jot down questions any questions you have. You'll have a chance at the end to ask it and I can answer it on the spot, but there are many who wanted to attend who are unavailable and that's also the reason I, uh, we have it wired together here and we're getting to film this so you can watch it later and those who miss can also watch it, but we'll use the questions that you write down for us, comb over those, we'll put together a frequently asked question part on that web page so that <laughs> we can get those addressed and some I might need a little bit of time to get a better answer for you. So I do want you to write those down and take as many as you need right through our little presentation. I'm really trying to get you out of here by 440, 540, I already passed 440 um, and that's kind of the timeline that, that we're shooting for. It might be 545 because now I've waxed a little long. Um, here's your first task. I'm going to show you something. At the end I'm going to ask you a question about it but I'm not going to tell you what the question is before you watch it so be very focused. <laughs> Good luck. This goes for about 45 minutes. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, that's it. That's all I'm showing you right there. Here's your question. How long will it take to print all those pages? This is a contest. And you want to win. This is a contest. I want you to, and you're free to use the people right next to you, the people real close to you. I want you to think through this. How long will it take to print all those pages? That's all I'm giving you right now. If you need scratch paper, I do have a ton right over here. In fact, I'll walk it around. You have about three minutes to start tackling this. How long will it take to print all those pages? Thank you. If you can wrap up that last bit of your conversation, who's got it? Who's got the answer? You've got it. Do I? Can I write on a whiteboard? There's no whiteboard. Someone on your iPad, jot down some of these guesses here, could you? Can I have a little quick comment first? No, no. Of course you can. Go ahead. The power's in the question. And I had to look at it three times. Okay. I think they're only asking about the three sheets. And I'm going to say between 15 and 20 seconds. About how long? Oh. 15 to 20 seconds. Oh. oh. That's, 
Okay, so if it's the three sheets, she's saying about 15 yeah. to 20 seconds. That'll be interesting. Yeah, that's what made me. Good, good. Wait one second. <laughs> What's your thoughts? Until the last sheet goes through the printer. <laughs> I like it. We're going for riddles at scout camp now. <laughs> What'd you think? Assuming, making some assumptions, 30 pages is an assumption. Okay. It takes the same amount of time to print a page, whether there's more on it or not. Okay. Given that we've given three pages that printed, <coughs> say about one and a half seconds per page, I say max about one minute to That's one and a half. That's what we've done. Yeah. A few like that, a minute to minute and a half? Is that what you said? Did you get that one jotted down? Mrs. French. Oh, I Being that time is abstract, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the right answer because I'm thinking, am I going to print them all in one day? Or am I going to print them several? You guys are taking this to a whole new level for me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go right here. Exactly. Let me get two or three more guesses here. Poltergeist that exist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Always come in and screw things up. So my first question is: Is that machine going to work exactly. for the entire Always. time? And will there be any brownouts that could blow it out? Absolutely not. So, Would never happen. So we're not going to take that as a variable in there. So that's so a possibility. Get the room. <laughs> Let me do two final ideas here. Go ahead, sir. HP.com. <laughs> hey, I like this. <laughs> okay. Okay, hold, hold on to that. There, there's some interesting thoughts there, and we're going to come back to that right there. One more, and then we're actually going to move on. Those pages have already been printed, so the answer is zero. <laughs> now, let me ask another question before we go to the next slide. I heard this as I was coming around and listening to some of the people rack their brains. A lot of people said to me, I need more. Yes. What more? Information. What do you need? What, what more information would you like? How long does it take per page? How long does it take per page? He gave you that right there. Boom. How many pages there are? How many pages are there? What you were actually qualifying as those. As those. If it's. And let's do a quick disclaimer no riddle, no tricks. <laughs> Just to take that part off the table. Okay, so there we are. We're, we're starting to realize what would be relevant information in this. And a lot of different strategies on how you came about getting it. I think that's my next one here. Let me uh, jump right in. What information you need to solve the problem? And there's some ideas. Let me give you two more pieces. I'm going to give you about a minute and a half more to tweak your guess. A timer. Some are wondering what the rate was. Let's take a look. Here it goes. Here's your timer. I underestimated when I first saw it. What do we got? Ten seconds? How many thought it was about ten seconds? What was our, what did you get off Google? According to Google, it goes um, in that, in draft mode, you can get up to 24 pages per minute. Hmm, okay. I like it. I don't know. <laughs> Here's a little bit more. <laughs> Some asked it'd be really relevant for us to know how many is in that stack. How many do you think? 35. Do you want to see the very last page printed? Here's the very last page printed. You got a minute and a half. A minute and a half. I've given you two more bits of information. See how that helps. You asked for it and there you go. A minute and a half. No tricks. No riddle. All right. Now, now, just to clarify, no tricks. There's no riddle. <laughs> Who thinks they've got a pretty good guess on how long it would take to print that stack? And now we know there's 88 sheets in that stack. They got 304.18666667 seconds. Boy, precise to the second. So 300, how many seconds? 304. 304. Five, 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 five minutes. Five minutes, okay. We like that? There's no answer key. There's no answer key for us to flip to the back of, but what we are going to get to do is watch the video. Now, it's fast forward for your pleasure. <laughs> Here we go.
Now it runs really fast. It's terrifying to watch that timer and know what your guess is. Here we come. Five minutes? Anyone closer? Some said five. What'd you have? Four and a half minutes. You'd be amazed. When I first did this, I actually got four minutes, 17 seconds, and 19 hundredths of a second. It was amazing. I did. I was like four minutes off. I wasn't even close. I want you to, while I, I show you, it, this is about a five minute clip, and then we're going to go through some of the nuts and bolts of our STEM school here. But while I show you this, I want you to be thinking of this. Why teach this way? What we just did. Um, some of it's going to be discussed in this next little video clip, but I also want you to be thinking about it in the terms that I'm going to give you one last turn to your neighbor moment after this to start bouncing those ideas off. Why teach this way? Here we go. Can I ask you to, um, to please recall a time when you really loved something, um, a movie, an album, a song, or a book, and you recommended it wholeheartedly uh, to someone you also really liked. And you anticipated that reaction, you waited for it, and it came back, and the person hated it. So by way of introduction, that is the exact same state in which I spend every working day of, of the last six years. <laughs> I teach high school math. Um, I, I sell a product to a market that doesn't want it, but is forced by law to buy it. I mean, that's kind of, it's just a losing proposition. So there's, there's a useful stereotype about students that I see. A useful stereotype about you all. Um, I could give you guys uh, uh, Algebra 2 final exam. And I'd, I'd expect no higher than a 25% pass rate. And both of these facts say, say less about you or my students than they do about what we call math education in the US today. So I, I'd like to talk about some problems that we're having with this. And, and to start with, uh, I'd like to break math down into two categories. One is computation. This is the stuff you've forgotten. For example, factoring quadratics with leading coefficient greater than one. Okay? This stuff is also really easy to relearn, provided that you have a really strong grounding in reasoning, math reasoning. We'll call it the, uh, the application uh, of math processes to the world around us. This is hard to teach. This is what we would love students to retain, even if they don't go into mathematical fields. Um, this is also something that the way we teach it in the US all but ensures they won't retain it. <laughs> so I'd like to talk about why that is, why that's such a calamity for society, uh, what we can do about it, and to, to close with why this is an amazing time to be a math teacher. Um, here's an example from a physics textbook. It applies equally to math. Uh, notice. First of all here that you have exactly three pieces of information there, each of which will figure into a formula somewhere eventually, which the student will then compute. Okay? Uh, th this conditions students to expect this, I, I believe, in real life. And, and ask yourselves, what problem have you solved ever that was worth solving where you knew all of the given information in advance, where you didn't have a surplus of information and you had to filter it out, or you didn't have uh, insufficient information and had to go find some? Um, I'm sure we all agree that no problem we're solving is like that. And the textbook, I think, knows how it's hamstringing students, because watch this. This is the practice problem set. When it comes time to the, the actual problem set, um, you have problems like this right here, where we're just swapping out numbers and, and tweaking the context a little bit. And if the student still doesn't recognize the stamp uh, this is molded from, it, it helpfully explains to you like, what, what sample problem you can return to to find, find, the, find the formula. Like you could literally, I mean this, pass this particular unit without knowing any physics, just knowing how to decode a textbook. That's a shame. And I'll yield the floor here for a second to Einstein, who I believe has paid his dues. He talked about the formulation of a problem being so incredibly important, and yet uh, in my practice in, in the U.S. here, we just give problems to students. We, we don't involve them in the, in the formulation of the problem. So 90% of what I do uh, with my five hours of prep time per week is to take fairly compelling elements of problems like this from my textbook and rebuild them in a way that supports math reasoning and patient problem solving. And here's how it works. Uh, I like this question. It's about a, a water tank. The question is how long will it take you to fill it up, okay? First things first, we eliminate all the sub-steps. Students have to develop those. They have to formulate those. And then notice that all the information written on there is stuff you'll need. None of it's a distractor, so we lose that. Students need to decide, all right, well, does the height matter? Does the side length matter? Does the color of the valve matter? What matters here? It's such an underrepresented question in math curriculum. Uh, so now we have a water tank. How long will it take you to fill it up? And that's it. And because this is the 21st century, and we would love to talk about the real world on its own terms, not in terms of 
line art or clip art that you so often see um, in textbooks, we go out and we take a picture of it. So now we have the real deal. How long will it take it to fill it up? And then even better is we take a video, a video of someone filling it up. And, uh, and it's filling up slowly, agonizingly slowly. It's tedious. Students are looking at their watches, rolling their eyes, and they're all wondering at some point or another, man, how long is it going to take to fill up? <laughs> That's how you know you've baited the hook, right? <laughs> and, and that question off this right here is really fun for me, because like, like the intro, I teach, I teach kids, uh, because of my inexperience, I teach the kids that are the most remedial, all right? And I got kids who will not join a conversation about math, because there's, like, someone else has the formula. Someone else knows how to work the formula better than me, so I won't, I won't talk about it. But here, every student is on the level playing field of intuition. Like, everyone's filled something up with water before. So I get kids answering the question, how long will it take? I got kids who are, who are mathematically and conversationally intimidated joining the conversation. We put, we put names on the board, attach them to guesses, um, and kids have bought in here. And then we, we follow the process I've described. And the best part here, or one of the better parts, is that we don't get our answer from the answer key in the back of the teacher's edition. We instead just watch the end of the movie. And that's terrifying, all right, because cause the, the theoretical models that always work out in the answer key, the back of the teacher's edition, like, like that's great, but it's scary to talk about sources of error when the theoretical does not match up with the practical. But those conversations have been so valuable, among the most valuable. Just a quick thought, and I'm going to give you that minute and a half to talk to your neighbor, and that's the video clip there. What problem that you've ever solved as a real functioning adult was ever worth solving that you had all that information you needed right up front? And that's kind of what we did with that little printer example. Take a minute and a half. The question I posed to you at the beginning of this was, why teach this way? Just a minute and a half to your neighbor or someone close by. Think through that. What, what benefits from teaching this way? <laughs> I think I got most of this side. A few finishing up their last conversation in the back there. Thoughts on that? Anyone want to share something that you talked about with your neighbor? Why teach this way? And maybe I want to add on, and I probably should have launched you into this a little bit. Thinking of our printer problem, what concepts did we tackle there? What things from the cores that we teach our, ma our math students and our, 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 our science students, did we actually accomplish during that? Any thoughts from your discussion? We'll take a couple. Uh, uh, making connections because you're going to touch that child who normally wouldn't open up and share. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned that uh, we're teaching them to become great problem solvers. Mm -hmm. Those are two things that just jump right out at you and make you. That hits me as well. I mean, what our objective here is, and we're going to end up with students who have to think critically exactly. about this situation. Exactly. They got to come up with some way to solve this problem. Exactly. Go ahead. An investigation approach to the, the problem there. Sure, absolutely. Go ahead. We're in sixth grade, I'm working with rates right now, so how many per minute? Mm -hmm. That's, That's in our sixth grade core, isn't it? I just taught four, seven, and four, eight, and that's so it. And if you're like me, you know there's lots of times where we teach, this is how we do rate. You teach, this is rates. You give them a whole lot of problems to practice it and hope that they're ready for that test. It's a very different context that way. Let me come right back to you, right over here. I think it's kind of a vote of confidence to the student, because it's like, you can solve this problem. You don't have to rely on an expert. Well, I'm not going to just show you how to solve it. Well, you, you didn't put to numbers it. to the, the problem. Sure, yeah. And that helps, uh, that'll help those kids that, that have no confidence. And I can't really help because, I mean, I had seen the end of that video, but a, a real situation, I wouldn't even know the, the answer there. And I loved his quote from Einstein of the formulation of the problem. Is, and I'm going to misquote it from there, is as powerful in, a, in that process as actually going through it. And how much we spoon feed that in this process. I'm, I see a lot of hands popping up and I love to keep letting you share those, but we're going to have to table this for maybe our next discussion because I want to make sure you get some of the nuts and bolts here and I want to keep that time that we're going to let you out of here by. What is a STEM school? <clears throat> maybe we'll correlate respond, make sure we know what each of those are and know... <laughs> they made up a new acronym for that. So. STEM schools, it is science, technology, engineering, math. You got it right there. And I actually said the bullet got a little misaligned. I want to say this, and it came right from the posting that you've probably seen already. 
STEM School has its foundation in a project-based approach and nurtures problem solving and critical thinking skills in students. Students master key concepts by solving authentic problems through methods of their own design and team collaboration and defend the reasons for their methods. Um, pivotal there. Let's just jump in, if we could, to our STEM School. Um, it is exciting. The picture you saw at the beginning is in the works. I've been there. I got to wear the hard hat. Did you get to see me in the hard hat? For, um, my favorite part so far. Here's a few things about Granite's New Elementary STEM School. It is not yet named, and so we keep calling it Granite's New Elementary STEM School. <laughs> um, hopefully that's not too far away. It's a pre, uh, preschool right through sixth grade, like so many of our elementary schools with preschool there. Um, 600 students, more or less, in this student population is what we're looking for. Half come from the boundary of that school. Um, some of you are come from schools, have been part of the little bit of the boundary realignment and are very aware of that. About 292 kids from the boundary and thus the rest would come in on open enrollment permit. They have come flooding in. Um, it, it, as you know, open enrollment window starts on December 1st and as of three days into business days, we've received, and of course they're not processed until it actually closes, uh, 52 I think is that's coming down. So they're very much coming in. We haven't done quite a bit of advertising yet on it. Um, integrate technology throughout the classrooms and I want to talk a little bit more about that because it's designed to facilitate STEM processes. Here's a little bit of the overview of the school and there's been many different versions of the plans. This one's actually a little bit outdated because I happen to know this wall ended up a little more straight there. Um, but you'll see in the planning how this building was designed to facilitate approaching the core curriculum in this manner. Um, you'll, you'll see outdoor labs and, and, and I'll show you in a second here, labs inside that are really meant to facilitate uh, a problem-based approach to the core curriculum here. Here's uh, again another outdated one, the, the other one didn't scan really well. Um, but showing some of the classrooms here, you'll see there's one on this floor and two on the next floor. It's actually glass walls all the way around a STEM activity center where so often we have these great projects and we have kids file through our classrooms to get to see them and, and this is being built very much with the mindset of we want to be able to showcase some of the things that these kids are doing in the, the, this uh, project based manner. It says computer room there and we actually, the current plans don't have a computer lab. We mentioned a moment ago that technology is meant to be very integrated into this learning process. I loved seeing in this little moment here, someone look it up on Google that's the world that's what we do <laughs> and to have that as not an end product but a means to our end use that technology in a way that's facilitating what we're actually trying to do so it was a great example there um, <clears throat> let's actually talk for a second I've got two slides on the curriculum these two bullets I want to hit quite clearly so that that we get a sense of this because I think um, there's often misperception about what a STEM school would be, and I'll actually have one more slide to really clarify those as well. Devoted to the integration of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, like we chanted, as the platform for instruction in the Utah core standards. That's our core curriculum. Um, if you haven't heard that before, you're going to hear it a lot coming up here. That is, that is, our, that is our, our mission here. Now, how we approach it might look just a little bit different those same standards, it's one of the reasons I kind of asked you, what concepts were we tackling in that printer, printer problem? Because that is a very key point that we are tackling those same standards. Also it says up here, students will participate in problem-based cooperative learning projects and will focus on developing the ability to think critically, and we had a few good comments on that, and solve complex problems. One more on this. This question, I, if you haven't been asked it yet, or if you haven't asked it yourself yet, you, you probably will. Students will enjoy physical and arts education and everything else that's common to all of our Granite Elementary schools. I get that phone call about six times a day so far. Are you going to do anything else? Is just science and... <laughs> My kid doesn't like science. <laughs> um, of course, th th what we've described there is a foundation approach in an, and really looking to integrate these subjects in a problem-based way. But we are, of course, including in that integration things such as art and our physical education and everything common in our Granite Elementary schools. It will be difficult to see when math ends and language arts begins. Now that's, I just picked those two, but that is a very big key here to understand that <coughs> even in this process, in that little problem we gave you, how many of these things we could have pulled in. I could have had you do your persuasive essay and get up here and t tell me the exact reason why you were confident in your 
your approach that, uh, to solve that problem, it's going to be a very integrated approach to those subjects. Teaching will focus on applied learning where content is integrated on a daily basis and students will engage in designing and creating. You know, when we say STEM, science, technology, mathematics really click with our core commitment. Engineering, not so much. And I, in a lot of ways, I think engineering summarizes the other three and the whole approach in a big way. My brother's a chemical engineer. We're not really trying to teach the curriculum that he needs to master. Engineers take these subjects in an applied manner and they're looking to be able to create. That is something very big in what we're looking to do with our core curriculum at the STEM school. What it is not, and this I want to be very clear about because it's the questions that I hear so often, so you can help be our cheerleaders on this and helping to clarify when people are a little confused on it. It is not a magnet school for students gifted in math and science. That's probably the one I hear the most. This is a school I've described already. It's got our normal boundary population. It's got a first come, first serve open enrollment. Um, it's not something that people are testing and qualifying to get in like might um, happen in a magnet situation. This is an approach to teaching our core curriculum and we will have ability levels from the top to the bottom just like we love teaching as educators and that's something to be very aware and I know Mrs. Lindsay hit that to start with. A school focused on merely ratcheting up math and science time or rigor. A lot of STEM schools kind of feel that's the approach to take. We're going to expand the time we're doing math. We're going to expand the time we're doing science. We're going to make our our math maybe one grade level harder than it. It's not trying to take those subjects and ratchet them up and make them a lot more rigorous. Um, I, I don't doubt that might, that's going to happen in the process, but it's actually taking that as our conceptual foundation for our curriculum. A school outfitted with technology for the sole purpose of teaching how to use the technology, and I do want to emphasize that one. The technology is going to be cool. It really will be. It needs to be the means and not the end. And it's so easy for cool technology to become the end. That's really going to be counterintuitive of where we're going with our STEM school. It's that this is, like everything else, integrated as, as tools um, for the curriculum we're, we're going with our students. Finally, teaching in isolation. Sorry, what it's not is teaching in isolation. And segregating the curriculum. I think we've quite hit that, but um, with professional learning communities and a very data-driven approach of focusing on what it is our students need to learn, how we're going to teach them, how we'll know that they've actually mastered it, what are we going to do when they don't get it, and what do we do if they've already got it, and you've heard that. You can't do it alone. You we, we can't have that, and that's where we need um, individuals who are able to very much, in sometimes a vulnerable fashion, put down um, on their common form assessments and their, uh, their acuity scores and say, boy, my kids aren't quite doing the same as yours are. What are we going to do next? Um, so that is certainly not something um, teaching isolation at our STEM school. Now, as I hit this next part here, I want to introduce two fabulous people here. We actually have Donette McNeil Waters from our Human Resources and Chad Carpenter in the back, director of our um, elementary. The process of applying has, has begun. Uh, many of you, if not most of you, have seen that it was posted on Monday. And that posting goes through till the 14th, so that's all this week and all next week. If you've had so much fun tonight and you want to get a seat again, you can watch this again on the webpage tomorrow, but it might be something that helps you know what, what you're applying for and also that you can share with others who maybe couldn't make it tonight. So the posting's up, just like I said right there. And the next one is... Um, the interviews are actually going to begin af after the winter recess. It's a complicated time in December. We'll begin those after the winter recess. I want you to be aware that we, in as, as kind of a manner as, as we can, we'll, we'll take good care of you in the interviews and we'll also probably come out and get to see how you apply um, what you share with us in your interviews in your own classroom. And we'll do similar interviews and observations through January and February. Come spring. We're looking to get all the contract teaching positions filled for the new STEM school because we will begin next school year. Um, and as soon as possible, we'd like our, our teachers to be thinking this way and, and preparing their, their hearts and souls for what it's going to be like teaching at the new Granite Elementary STEM school.